Hello, I'm Cap Times local economy reporter, Natalie Yar. Welcome to the Cap Times Idea Fest. I'm happy to be here to facilitate this conversation about how people individually can fight the huge beast that is climate change. It's a daunting mission, but I'm hoping that by the end of this discussion, it will feel a little more doable. First, let me introduce our panelists. Christina Carvajal is the founder and executive director of Wisconsin Eco Latinos, a nonprofit organization that strives to assist the Latino community in Wisconsin in combating environmental hazards and advocating for a just and sustainable environment. Carvajal has a background in engineering and is a member of the Sustainable Madison Committee. Stephen Cavill is the owner of Madison Home Performance, which provides energy audits for those looking to make their homes more comfortable or energy efficient. Susan Millar is an anthropologist and a volunteer leader with 350 Wisconsin, a grassroots, grassroots group mobilizing to halt climate change. She co-leads the group's community climate solutions team and participates in many other 350 Wisconsin teams. And Maria Redmond is the director of the Wisconsin Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy, where she de helps develop and implement recommendations from Governor Tony Evers' Task Force on Climate Change and leads the implementation of the state's first ever clean energy plan. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Maria, uh, let's start with you. Um, I imagine that most people watching this already know a decent bit about climate change. Um, but can you just set the stage for this conversation by explaining why it's so important that we all act now? Definitely. Thank you so much for having me, Juan. Um, you know, we, we're we really seeing a lot in the news about climate change and a lot of um, action around climate change. And so the thing about Wisconsin is that when we relate ourselves to what climate change is and what we can do about it, uh, a lot of times we're going to be thinking about the weather, uh, particularly rising temperatures. And um, even this summer, we we experienced uh, extreme heat, uh, some days with extreme heat, which had an effect on air quality. We also had some hazy days uh, because of wildfires in Canada, and the and and obviously our our air was affected by those hazy days, and that also affects our health. And so. Um, we in Wisconsin have a deep appreciation for uh, our outdoors, our food, our people. And so mess with any of those. And, you, you know, we, we start to think about like, what can we do to ch change this trajectory of um, impacts on our communities and impacts on our outdoors and our water systems and, and all of these things. So, uh, you know, I think, most people in Wisconsin um, are really wanting to see some action around, you know, the, reducing the amount of climate change impacts in the state. And so water issues are top of mind. Air pollution from wildfires and severe flooding, we've seen that in Wisconsin, are um, also on the list. Um, and a lot of people support action. So I think that, you know, I'm excited about this panel today because it would really show the uh, people in Wisconsin who are really looking to themselves, looking to their business, um, looking to their community um, to help them to understand mm -hmm. what they can do related to climate change mitigation and, and really what can we put into action and what are those strategic things that we can do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and our impact uh, globally on, on the environment. Thank you, Maria. And uh, I think you've already segued us nicely. Um, we'll be coming back to you uh, a bit later to hear more about the work the state of Wisconsin is doing to fight climate change. Um, but as you said, I'd like to take us now to um, our other panelists, uh, each of whom is working locally in a different way to address climate change. Uh, can you each talk about how you first started doing this work and where you found your niche. Um, and uh, I'll say, let's start here with Stephen. Uh, thanks. Uh, happy to be here on the panel with everyone. Um, I I confess I'm, I'm, I'm probably the most selfish person here. I uh, 
when I started the work that I'm doing today, I wasn't thinking about others. I was thinking about myself. I was thinking about my pocketbook. I was thinking about making my home energy efficient. Um, I wasn't out for the greater good. Um, that's, that's just the truth of it. I guess I was just looking more at my own belly button and my own pocketbook. Um, you know, growing up, I've, I've, I've always liked a good value. I'd buy three Honda Civics over a Mercedes like every day of the week. Um, solid, reliable car, you know, a bomb could go off and that thing would still run. Right. I mean, I would always do that. Um, I like when things run efficiently. Um, I don't like waste, particularly when waste costs me money. So put those, uh, characteristics of myself, my personality into the circumstances of me buying a house. And you have a recipe for a guy that just kind of goes bonkers, making his house super efficient. Um, and, uh, you know, green. Uh, so I ended up, uh, buying a 1957 house on the East side of Madison for $205,000. Um, a thousand square feet upstairs is just a simple rectangle. It's a simple matchbox. And, um, I just went gangbusters and I started air sealing and insulating. And when I did all that work myself, I called up mg e and asked how my bills compared to the last homeowner. And then you can get the graphs comparing your energy usage to other people around Madison. I cut my electric use by 45% and I cut my gas usage by 50% per, per, per just using insulation and uh, mm -hmm. air sealing, right? Um, first time DIYer, like no experience, just kind of going for it because I wanted my house to have low bills. Um, and that just started this, 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 this ball rolling where I did more and more, like I had the old electric resistance water heater it was costing me 502 bucks per year to, to run per the label. And then I, I installed a heat pump water heater and that's 125 bucks, 125 bucks per year. And then I, uh, got rid of my gas furnace and we just got a heat pump now and, and my house is all electric. Right. So it was just like this one thing led to the next one thing, which led to the next. And. I just, you know, I kind of drank the Kool-Aid, got super excited. And then I started a business doing this and helping people um, make their homes more safe, more comfortable, more uh, durable and more energy e efficient. Those are actually all one and the same thing, but I didn't realize that at the time. And um, here I am today. So <laughs> from there, let's go to Susan. Okay, well, thanks a lot, a lot for in inviting me to this panel. I, I'd love to build on what Steve Stephen just said. Um, you were talking about how you hate waste and how you, you were doing this because of your bottom line sort of thing. I kind of came at this from uh, the standpoint of also hating waste, but hating waste from the standpoint of waste equals harm to our planet. Uh, and I want to get back to that in a little bit. Um, but I'll start with my house because um, I have a 90 year old house on the on the west side of Madison. And uh, um, so uh, but the reason I did, I made it all electric, which I did back in 2020, um, was because I just couldn't bear when the heat went on and I knew I was burning gas. It just drove me nuts. And so I was running the house really, really cold in the winter just because I didn't want that darn thing to turn on. And, and so um, I ended up, you know, figuring out how to find a cold weather air source heat pump. But but first, going back to you, Stephen, the first thing I did was get an energy efficient analysis of the house. Yes, it needed more insulation and what a huge difference it made. I, I, I totally agree with you on that. But then I needed to add the air source heat pump and um, and then, you know, the hybrid air source water heater and uh, got rid of the gas stove and moved to an induction stove. And of course, I'm fortunate enough that I was able to have solar on the roof. And then I got an EV and, you know, and now it's delightful to say that mg and &E owes me money, at least in the summer, which is really fun. <laughs> you know, there's no better thing than calling mg and &E and saying, would you please turn off my gas? Um, what's the problem? Not a problem. Just please turn off my gas. I'm not using it anywhere, <laughs> you know? so. Um, that was fun. But then, you know, I think, but I, what I want, really want to say is that um, electrifying the house is, I guess, an artifact or an outcome of a whole way of seeing, which I like to call the way of seeing through a lens that looks at 
circular use of resources instead of linear use of resources. And so I have a whole lot to say about that um, because it just shapes everything I do at the personal level in, in my life in terms of reducing uh, waste, both through what we do with food, what we do with manufactured items, all of these things that would that we normally, when we use the linear model about resources, they basically end up, in, these, this stuff ends up as quote waste, which goes to a landfill and is gone forever as a resource for us. And the, the real kicker there is that it's not just the materials, it's not just the aluminum or the, you know, whatever it is that's getting turned from a resource that this gorgeous earth gives us to something that can never be used again. It's that <laughs> it uses some sort of fossil fuel all along the way. So, you know, which is also an extracted thing that we that we lose forever. And so this whole question of how to reduce the amount of waste that I personally am engaged in producing, um, it just comes from wearing a, using a lens that, that sees everything in terms of what what is going back to the earth versus what is being wasted and that will never come back and will never be used by our children. You know, I, I really love that saying, you know, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. So I want all that stuff to be there for the children. And so we have to use the circular way of thinking about reuse, non-use is best, uh, then of course reuse and, and recycle. And so that just drives my personal life and, um, and it's certainly what led to the to the to the house and and then all that led to um what I think I know uh we're also going to be talking about um getting engaged in uh climate climate groups that are focusing pulling together as uh, concerned citizens to help our organizations um whether they be government organizations school organizations uh, commercial industrial organizations um, stop wasting, be aware that they're wasting and 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 stop polluting our environment and harming our climate. So I think I'll just stop there. Wonderful, Susan. And Christina, let's go to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, well, my story is different. Um, I had been an environmental advocate all my life, and um, I saw how um, <clears throat> pollution affects uh, people of color, minorities, uh, disadvantaged communities in a greater proportion than others. Um, air pollution um, is a great issue for uh, disadvantaged communities. And um, also there is climate change, right? Um, climate change action, the urgency of the moment. So I decided to um, fund, um, I founded a Wisconsin Eco Latinos to advocate for our communities um, on environmental justice issues and to help the, the Latino community and other minorities um, take action on climate change. Um, I want to add that um, everyone has been talking about energy efficiency and um, it, it's true, most people, you know, might, might be very familiar with uh, climate change issues, but for the people that is not, uh, we need to remember that um, Wisconsin energy is produced um, almost, we use about 70% of the energy in Wisconsin is produced by fossil fuels. And as we know, fossil fuels um, are the biggest uh, carbon emission, em, 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 carbon producing em, situations. Um, so um, that's how, yeah, that's how we, we wound up, you know, uh, we're passionate about um, climate change action. We help our community um, be engaged, understand what's going on, uh, understand that um, climate action um, is something that, you know, there are many, many 
things that we can do. There are many things that we can we can do to um, to adapt to to climate change. As Maria was saying, uh, now we have um, you know these uh, heat waves and a different weather. You know, the different extreme weather. What we what we can call extreme weather. And we need to start looking into how to help our communities prepare for this extreme weather. Thank you, Christina. Um, and so many of us, um, I think, realize that climate change is real. Uh, as Christina pointed out, of course, um, there's always still room for um, helping people uh, learn more about that and understand that. But um, many people realize climate change is real um, and that we need to take immediate action. Um, but the whole problem can sometimes feel overwhelming, maybe paralyzing sometimes. Um, so I'd like to ask um, each one of you, um, where do you think that folks should start? Mm. And I'll, um, yeah, who'd like to take this one to start? I'd be happy to kick it off. Um, so there's an ancient proverb, uh, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. And so I know that uh, it may seem overwhelming because um, climate change tends to have this gloom and doom feel um, when you read it in the media. And really it's about everyone here is talking about solutions and we're working on solutions and action. And so one thing is I know that we in the state want to be a resource for folks. Um, we have a lot of great programs and a lot of great uh, state partners that are working in this space. Uh, 350 Wisconsin is, is one um, and, and it's great to have and Wisconsin Eco Latinos and, and our um, folks who are doing this work um, are always great places to start. I would say contacting the Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy, OSCE at, OSCE at wisconsin.gov. Um, we want to be a resource for you. Our state energy office, who uh, manages a lot of uh, federal grant programs. Um, it's the Office of Energy Innovation over at the Public Service Commission. They have also um, a, a really great uh, support and resources. I know there are a lot of folks in this space that are really ramping up. So making that first call to you know our office, to the state energy office to focus on energy. Uh, that's another um, great resource and tool. So I, those would be my suggestions, but like even if you, the first call is to someone working in this space, there's a huge network of people working on um, action uh, related to climate change. So I just say, take that first step, make a call um, to who you think might be the best um, and then, or send an email and, and it'll at least open that door and get you um, in the right network to be able to get some of your questions answered. Yeah, I, I can step up next. Um, well, uh, building on your initial point, Nelly, uh, I think a lot of people are experiencing climate anxiety. And um, a great way to deal with that is, is to get engaged in climate action because it feels like, you know, you're taking that one for that first step in uh, the, the, the thousand mile journey that Maria was mentioning. And um, the thing that is extraordinary about acting as climate concerned citizens uh, building uh, kind of in collaboration with with folks in in government such as Maria, is that there's something about the citizen voice. So, like within 350 Wisconsin, there are a large number of us who identify problems, um, situations in our cities or in the county, or uh, with uh, energy equity, for example, like which Christina was talking about, and. So what we do is we can we can make comments, we can call up our alders or our supervisors or our legislators. And if we make our voices known, that makes a huge difference. The first time I understood that was when somebody told me that that it was a single person, it was a person in engineering in the engineering department in um, the city of Madison, was that there was this one person who just kept on hammering on the need to recover this particular um, wetland. 
And finally, the city paid attention and they did it. And I was like, if one person can make the difference in recovering a wetland, what can 50 of us saying something about the Building Energy Savings Program do? And what, you know, and it turns out that the first thing we started to do was to work with, for example, the Plan Commission in the city of Madison. And some of the plan commissioners were like, you know, you are the first people we've ever heard from who are actually talking to us about our sustainability goals instead of complaining about something that is not going to look great from your backyard. And they really thanked us for just being public voices that cared about climate goals. And so it turns out that having that kind of voice, which we can't really do all by ourselves, but which is wonderful when we're working together, actually makes a difference. And it and it helps helps address that sense of, gee, I, can't, I don't know what to do. I can't do anything. It really does help. Okay, I can go um, next. Um, so where, where to start? Um, of course, you know, ideally um, clean energy is number one. Um, if we move to towards clean, if we get Wisconsin moving towards clean energy, this is going to improve. This is not only going to help climate change, but it's going to improve air quality because of what I had mentioned that uh, energy in Wisconsin is most of the energy is produced by fossil fuel, including natural gas, um, which sometimes you know the name makes it look like it's is is not as bad but it's still a fossil fuel. Um, it also, um, you know, adopting electric vehicles, it's another option, another step. Um, and I understand it might not be um, at mo you know, many people's reach, you know, it is still, you know, um, clean energy, uh, solar panels, electric cars are still expensive, but there are other steps, you know, individual actions that people can take. Um, that's, you were mentioning, you know, energy efficiency, uh, weatherizing our homes is very important. Um, there is one very easy action that we need from everyone and it's planting trees. Planting trees, it's, it's easy and it's very important because um, trees can reduce uh, pollution. They can reduce the effect of uh, urban um, heat islands. Um, and they can beautify neighborhoods too. Uh, that's a very easy action for individuals to, to take. And there are many others, you know, like ways with reducing waste as we, we were talking about and uh, buying local. Buying local is very important because buying local is uh, it, it's the perfect solution for our, our local economy and, and it reduces um, car our carbon footprint too. Big time. I guess I'll uh, I guess I'll jump in if I'm not interrupting anybody here. Um, uh, I like what you've all said. Um, I'm I'm drawn to what Susan said about uh, this idea of making your voice heard and sharing. Um, I'm literally on my bike biking around the neighborhood after I did a Google Map search of who has solar, and I'm going to <laughs> knock on people's doors and I'm telling them about MG&E and Alliance proposal to end net metering. And people don't even know this is going on, right? And I'm just like pulling my hair out. I'm already losing my hair. I'm pulling my hair out. I'm like, geez, people, like we gotta know about this. Come on now, you know. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get the word out here. But in terms of what we can do about, uh, you know, how we can start to to take action on so, some of this stuff, I did a little bit of googling but before uh, getting out here and chatting with y'all. And you know, like 21% of our U.S. national energy goes towards our housing stock. And obviously, I'm in like the the weatherization sector and. And uh, from my perspective, there is a, uh, you know, when I want to start working out, like first I want to go buy like all new gear and like new shoes and like maybe a new track suit and, you know, blah, 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 and like drop a couple hundred bucks. Cause then like, I feel like I've actually done something, even though I haven't really started the, the, the difficult work of, you know, tuning my, my body, blah, blah, blah. And I think that sometimes there can be a tendency from homeowners in my experience to be like, yo, Steven's here. All right. I think we should, we're probably gonna need the, the new windows, right? You know, and like that's just something big and shiny to impress the uh, the Joneses. Or I think we need to get an EV here. That's really going to make the the difference. And and really, um, the work 
to begin uh, from a weatherization perspective on your house is is not sexy work and it's work that people can't see. Uh, it's not a spray tan. It's not a new hairdo before the, the big dance. It's like eating healthy vegetables and, and working out. It's like air sealing and insulating your attic, then your basement, then your crawl space, and then the exterior walls on your first floor, right? And you can't see any of that stuff. And it's not glamorous, um, but that's where you're going to get huge payback. And that's where you're going to lower the heating and cooling needs of your home, the energy needs of your home. That's where your house is going to consume less of the precious resources like the fossil fuels if it's running on natural gas, right? So um, I would just say resist the urge to like go big and drop 20 grand on windows or something, something, something when like that's not the best place to start here. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. Um, really appreciate that. Um, and um, on a similar note to what Stephen just said, um, you know, there are there are a lot of ways to address climate change. Um, some of them require more time um, and or money than others do. Um, you know, installing solar panels is um, fantastic. Also, a big investment. Um, getting an electric car, the same. Um, and um, you know, depending on one's home, sometimes switching to electric appliances might increase one's um, energy bills, depending. Um, so um, I just would like to toss it back to each of you for some suggestions about ways that people who are short on time or short on money or both um, might think about what they can do. Something, maybe some easy starting points where time or money are not really the obstacle. Yeah, I can go there. Um, so yeah, definitely, it, it's a challenge. Um, it, we we would love to, you know, going to into clean energy is part of the solution, but it's it's still expensive for many in our community, uh, for disadvantaged communities. Uh, solar panels is is out of the reach, uh, as well as electric cars. Um, and uh, and and it's it's a challenge for you know we need to find a solution, and we're hoping. Um, the investment in the Inflation Reduction Act can help us um, reduce this gap because we don't want, you know, the, these disparities. We don't want to have, um, we don't want to have a neighborhoods, you know, wealthy neighborhoods going with solar energy and then this uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods just just flat, you know, not not having um, any solar energy. Um, even though um, this is, a, you know, for disadvantaged communities, it's it's difficult to go to adopt a clean energy. Um, they can still take many steps to um, to mitigate climate uh, climate change. Um, I always say, you know, there are there are there are tricks as, as Stefan was talking. You know, um, I always say, uh, like, you can you, if you can get a, an electric car. You can uh, look for a car that is is has high uh, fuel efficiency. Um, you can also do the trick of the um, maintaining uh, your tires well, you know, inflated. It's it's basic, but it's amazing that it, it adds up. You know, it saves uh, fuel, and uh, you know, as we said, you know, individual actions turn into uh, collective actions, and we we can make a big impact uh, like that. Yeah, I, I would just like to add, you know, this is a, a, t a challenging question, and I'm so glad, Christina, that you're doing the work you're doing. Um, you're making a, a big difference with a lot of communities. Um, I would add that, um, kind of going back to that idea of using a lens that looks at whether fossil fuel is involved, um, that, you know, the, the, the choice to use mass transit wherever possible is really important or moving to, to bicycling or walking. Um, I would definitely build on Stephen's point about if you if you have, if you own your property, you have any resources and if you can help get money from, from Focus on Energy and from the Inflation Reduction Act and so forth, insulate your house. That is a huge, huge point. Uh, another thing I guess I would say is that the, um, I mean, this is really kind of a tricky point, but if you can live in a more dense area, um, because density, the, the, the emissions associated with 
per person emissions in dense living situations is, is much less. I mean, if you look at a map that shows uh, per person emissions, and you, you'd never believe that downtown New York City is the greenest place per person in our in the USA. Um, the worst thing that we can do in some sense is to build low income housing on the outskirts of where people live and need to go in order to do everything they do, shopping, doctors, whatever, because there's a huge amount of loss of green space, of healthy places for people to live. Um, there's a huge increase in transportation, and especially if your transportation is a, a car that isn't energy efficient, you're using money that way and you're, and you, you're emitting more fossil fuel. You're using your time. Uh, it's, I mean, there's just a lot of things that are really bad about it. And one of the things I know about Europe is that they actually have these zones around cities. You come to the edge of the zone, no buildings. The buildings are all dense. And so they save their their green space for agriculture and for you know things of that sort. And they, they prevent sprawl. So we in the United States, you know, especially starting in the 50s, sprawl was everything, you know, and it also, of course, you know, fostered a lot of racial discrimination and so forth. And people moved out into the into the sprawls. So if we can be, be aware of the cost to our environment and to our people of low density, low of low density, low income sprawl, I think that's something that I I, I really want to add to them to the conversation here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in here. I was thinking about, you know, uh, five fixes under 50 bucks or something like that. You know, maybe it's five fi fixes under 100 bucks in terms of like things that I can do on my home. Um, I crawl up into a lot of attics <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the attic hatch or the attic access is often uh, just a piece of wood. And um, when that piece of wood is doesn't have any insulation on the back of it, the effectiveness of all the insulation in the entire attic drops by a staggering 27 percent. Uh, it's just astounding. So I guess, you know, for, you know, 25 bucks in insulation, maybe some weather stripping, you know, you can uh, you could make that attic hatch insulated and air sealed. That's probably the very first thing I do. Second fix under 50 bucks is I'd probably go buy some foam board at the big box store and some spray foam. And I would air seal my rim joist probably for one sheet of four by eight foam is probably 40 bucks. And uh, cans of spray foam are five bucks a pop. You could probably do at least half your attic for 50 bucks right there. Or I'm, I'm sorry, half of your rim joist in your basement for fit for 50 bucks. Thirdly, I'd probably, um, I might like buy a smart thermostat so I could like control it remotely in case I forgot to turn it up or or down when I was not at at, at home or so that MG&E or whoever can like manipulate it so like that, that they can use it during off peak time so that we can control the, the energy in the grid or whatever. Um, I would uh, fourthly, I would not um, I would never buy an AC again. I would only buy a heat pump. No, no person should ever buy an air conditioner again ever. Um, and uh, fifthly, I would probably take some more cans of a little spray foam. I go up in my attic <laughs> and any penetration is going through the roof decking or uh, th through the uh, attic floor. I would spray foam with uh, so that it was as airtight as possible. But I, uh, you never want to insulate until you air seal. Uh, it's like uh, going out in the end of the dock on Lake Mendota and there's a big breeze coming off the from the north side of the lake and you're out there in a really holy sweater the air is going to go right through the insulation and it's going to be by and large ineffective. You need to air seal the house first. A house can never be too tight. Never, never, never. Houses don't need to breathe. People do. So there's a couple of little nuggets that might help someone who's on a limited, a limited budget. Stephen, I think we should give you an award for packing so much in. To so <laughs> Sorry. Time. Yeah. Hey, you, and, and just back to like what Susan was saying earlier about like, you know, we borrow the, the earth from our grandkids. Like, like, Every time that I'm doing something that I think is cool that I have energy for, I am sharing it with like, like I'm putting out a YouTube video. I'm like telling my neighbor, I'm like telling my friend whose house I go to to play a video game. Like, I'm like, dude, you should just do this thing. Right. And, and so 
when you stumble upon something that's good, that has an impact on your health or well-being or blah, blah, you share it with people close to you and say, hey, dude, can you just tell one other person? And then this thing can just become a tree and blossom and we can get the word out about this stuff because, you know, consumers are in the driver's seats with a lot of this stuff and and sharing the 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 information like with your neighbors so that they can do the same thing or that, that they can make a good choice, right? So that we're not like these little islands, like get to know your neighbor and help them out. Okay, pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, such really thoughtful answers there. Um, Maria, I'm going to pass it back to you for a moment. Can you tell us about a few of the things the state of Wisconsin is doing uh, to fight climate change or to try to make it easier for individuals to do so? Absolutely. So for eight years, prior to Governor Evers' administration, we were not actually allowed to talk about climate change. Uh, in the state. And so we saw a really big shift and a champion through our administration when Governor Evers came in and said, okay, look, we're going to talk about climate change. We're going to talk about the cost. We're going to understand the cost of inaction. And we're going to do, we're going to take some really important steps to set Wisconsin up for success and create that momentum so that we're really addressing climate change. And through that, he created this office, the Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy, where we're focused on 100% carbon-free electricity consumed in the state by 2050 and coming up with strategies on how to accomplish that. So um, the governor created the governor's task force on climate change and brought industry professionals, youth activists, tribal nations, elected officials, uh, just a bunch of diverse perspectives to further inform um, the governor on uh, recommendations on how to move forward with climate mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation, reducing the amount of, of emissions in the state and the benefits of kind of the domino effect of benefits that come from that and adaptation where we have already created, like we've got the, the climate change impacts already in place and we need to do things to make sure that we can adapt to those um, irreversible um, changes. So the task force came up with a final report, December 2020, with 55 climate solutions, and including climate justice, which uh, Christina referenced that, that, you know, the health impacts, the uh, impacts of climate change tend to um, impact our Black, Indigenous, and persons of color communities more than other communities, also our rural communities. And so we have energy, transportation, agriculture, resilient systems, uh, clean economy, education, uh, food systems, and forestry, like all of the different sectors um, and, and, and all of the um, different opportunities that we could be thinking about. Also, in April of 2022, the governor pushed out the, or actually our office <laughs> helped to inform the governor and um, and our partners uh, related to clean energy. We focused in on clean energy and we published the first state's first ever clean energy plan. We were one of eight states in the nation that did not have a clean energy plan. And we created this blueprint on actionable strategies that the state can take to one, deploy more clean energy technology, optimize energy efficiency, innovate in transportation, and to upgrade and update our buildings and industry. And so everything that this panel has been talking about is has really been supported by the governor and this administration. And, and central to all of that are our values, equity, justice, and collective action. Again, you've heard heard that throughout yeah. uh, this panel session. So equity, making sure that all Wisconsin residents re can feel the benefits and receive the benefits of of our our actions. That it's you know from a health perspective, from an economy perspective. Let's get you know that we actually send fourteen point four or more billion dollars out of state to help meet our energy needs in Wisconsin. So. I can, we can all raise our hands and say, I could use some of that money in my pocket. So what can we do to keep more of those dollars here? Um, justice, making sure that we're focusing on our disadvantaged communities, those communities that have been impacted by climate change and making sure that they get to 
uh, reap the benefits and that they're not like energy burdens aren't increasing, um, that those environmental burdens aren't increased as we, as we transition and making sure that we're thinking through that. And then collective action. We're all working together on this. Like this, the government's not going to be the only one that's working on it. We all have to work together right. for the greater. So, and then the last thing I'll, I'll um, mention a couple things. Um, I, I, I said the last thing and then I added another thing on there. Sorry about that. But um, the federal government has been really um, pushing out a lot of funding and opportunities. So we want to bring as much of that money to Wisconsin as possible, like oh, we at, and the region, but let's get that money here. Um, there's, there's direct pay provisions, which are super exciting um, tax incentives for individuals. And we want to get the word out as much as we can to people to, to, to let them know that these tax incentives are available. And with the direct pay provisions, non-taxable entities, non-governmental organizations, local governments, um, state agencies can now be able to take advantage of tax credits and be able to get those heat pumps, electric vehicles, uh, you know, all of these, these types of things. And the last thing I'll mention is that the gov governor also created the Green Ribbon Commission on Clean Energy and Environmental Innovation. And the thought behind that is that Wisconsin really needs a financing mechanism to help support the deployment of renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, every, everything that we've outlined in the clean energy plan. But we need to be able to, if you want to take advantage, for example, if you want to take advantage, you're a resident, you want to take advantage of a tax credit, but you don't have the funding up front to be able to pay for that, a green financing mechanism could help cover those costs and be able to get, give you that opportunity. We've been talking about, you know, obviously the low hanging through, fruit through um, optimization of energy efficiency and the things that you can do in your home. But we know the really impactful stuff is the more costly stuff, right? The, that you might not have the funding to cover upfront. And so we wanna be able to create a financing mechanism through a green bank or a green innovation fund to be able to provide that funding upfront. So we're working, we're working on that right now. Um, I'm honored to be one of the commissioners on that and with uh, 19 or seven, 17 or right. to 19 other folks um, to be able to get that stood up and to be able to bring federal dollars, private funding, private capital, whatever we can to make sure that we're supporting and deploying as much of the technology as possible. I'll stop there. <laughs> wow. That's a lot, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, and um, with that, I think I'll I'll open it up to other folks um, on this kind of policy type front. Um, what um, what do you all think? Um, are are there other things that could be done on a big picture level? This doesn't have to be. This is this isn't about whether Marine's doing her job right or not, obviously. But um, you know, on a big picture level, are there things that could be? um being done maybe through policy or through collective action that might make it easier or more appealing for all of us as individuals to take these kinds of actions that can be difficult or that might come at some cost to ourselves well i mean i, I guess i could speak uh, from the standpoint of, of 350's community climate solutions team um the the sort of motto of that team is think global, act local. Um, and local meaning, at least with, the, with respect to that team, not at the state level, but really at the city and county level and maybe the school district and uh, other other organizations that are, that, that are within your community. And I, I would just go back to the, the power of the concerned citizen voice in all of those situations. Um, th there are situations where we in 350 have, have been approached by a city, um, a city sustainability office or a group of alders to say, we need your help. Um, and we've stepped up. There have been other circumstances and I'll just point to something that's happened at UW-Madison. Um, we got wind of a brand new plan for um, re, doing as basically a how are we going to use this land on the west campus uh, on the western part of our campus to make more money for the university 
well, it was like a real estate plan for making money. And we read it and we were like, oh my gosh, um, sustainability is completely absent from this. And it's, hey, it's 2023. So we contacted the people who are in charge of this and they sat down with us and they were like, thank you. We actually didn't really notice that we hadn't done that. We actually care about that. Will you help us, um, push us? Um, because we do care. This does matter. And it, you know, we need a new plan that we're going to be able to take to the regents, the Board of Regents, and having a lot of citizen support for that is going to make a difference. So again, it's that finding opportunities um, where something's going on in, in your local community that needs to be better uh, and, and, and saying something about it. So I guess I would say that, that that's a uh, a really important thing that we can do. Another thing I think that's very important is just celebrate the good. So, um, and this is something that the Dane County Office of Energy and Climate Change is doing super well with their uh, Climate Champions Program. So yeah, I mean, going back to a point that's, that Stephen was making, you don't know when you go by a building that's super well insulated and air sealed and so forth. Well, there are buildings in our community that are uh, not only net zero, but even in uh, some pushing positive positive zero and actually creating more energy than they're using, you'd never know. But um, with this Climate Champions Program, which 350 is helping to celebrate, um, these buildings get to be visible. And there's all kinds of other kinds of um, categories of um, non-use and reuse and clever, you know, clever activity like um, industries or businesses that are promoting um, ways of reducing their employees' transit costs and the miles they travel and you know all kinds of clever ways to celebrate what's working. And I think that's very important because um, there's kind of building on something Stephen said earlier. There is this thing about talking about it. You have to, we have to talk about it. That's part of the contagion theory of change. When once people start talking about it, noticing things, then it's like, huh, well, they did that. I guess, you know, I could try that. And that it, it's it it builds. So if we don't talk about it and we don't know about it, it's not gonna happen. So there's th those are a couple of things that I really wanted to, to talk about. Celebrate the good and talk about it. Use the contagion theory of change. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna echo Susan. Yeah, there uh, we're fortunate to have, uh, you know, the, the the policies that the the governor Evers through Maria's office are taking. Uh, also, the county office of energy and climate change is through. They're they're doing an excellent job too. Um, the city of Madison also is is uh, also working on uh, setting goals on a sustainability plan. To reduce, uh, you know, to become uh, um, carbon free, you know, um, a, a on uh, their own fleet and buildings, um, people is working, and and there is a lot of people working on it, and it's it's true. We need to celebrate all those achievements. It, we also need to, um, as you know, as as my my mission is, you know, make sure that that we don't forget, you know, disadvantaged communities. You know, sometimes we have the policy, we have the resources, everything is set up, but then it, we need to get to, we need to make sure those policies and resources get to um, disadvantaged communities. I think I, uh, I think I'll just say two, two, two things here. Um, I'm just going to continue to be a megaphone. And uh, I've actually, from this conversation, from what all you smart folks say, I'm actually going to contact the uh, Madison Building Department to share the good news about what's going on in my house. Um, you know, as, as we go forward and look at policy stuff, I think about uh, the whole MG&E stuff and kind of this, this attack on residential solar. I'm calling it attack. That's, that's, that's kind of my, my, my viewpoint. You know, it, it may be wrong. Um, but, you know, they're... they're uh, we buy a kilowatt hour of electricity from mg &E for 16 cents. And now they're, they're proposing that rather than uh, them buying our excess for people who have solar at 16 cents, they're gonna, they, they wanna buy it back at four cents and they wanna make net metering instantaneous. 
so that there's no more banking up of hours. And that's just a huge, it's just such a huge gut punch. And like, no one even knows that it's going on because everyone's thinking about, oh, like the rates are going to go up. Well, there's something so much bigger than, than the rates here. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, just talking about stuff like, like that, you know, going door to door, talking to neighbors. Um, and then secondly, something kind of on like the HVAC front, you know, when you got people like Susan who have an all electric house or me who have an all electric house. And I mean, my house is from 1957. Hers is even a, a, a little bit older. And then you go to people's houses who are, um, who don't even know about heat pumps, who are putting in like 60,000, 80,000 BTU, 100,000 BTU furnaces in the same size houses that we have. What on earth is going on here? What is going on here? Right. I mean, like, this is just like, like, like there is a huge breakdown of communication in terms of what's possible, what we're doing, what my bills are. They're still lower than everyone else's. I'm an all electric home and I, and I, and I don't even have solar. Right. And then what people are still doing, like what people are still doing. And, and like, like there's just a huge, and, and there's a, there's a huge gap in, in, in where people are with the technology and what people are putting into their homes. And maybe that's because there's a lack of sharing or, or, or people don't know, but I just wish that there was some greater, um, I don't know, standards or, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is there, but, but people like myself and Susan and many others are, are going forward, you know, uh, with, with all these changes and it's totally possible and we're doing it and we're living it. And then other people are just totally clues that, that this even exists. So I guess just keep being a megaphone and talking about that stuff. Um, yeah, thanks. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, as I am going to pose our last question now, but I'm going to kind of toss a couple things out to you all at at once for closing this, um, which is, um, I would like to ask, pass it back to each one of you um, to share any um, parting thoughts you have, um, especially with the idea of helping people feel um, ready um, and maybe inspired, enthusiastic um, uh, uh, to take on this challenge. Um, and with that, I would also say, um, please let us know if there is a way that people um, should follow up with you, should contact you, a way that you'd like um, them to be involved. Um, Stephen, I'm thinking of something that you mentioned to me once about showing off your home, um, not putting you on the spot here. But if that is something you, if people are curious about your home, feel free to let them know whether, how they can learn more about it. Um, and so with that, I'll pass I'll, I'll, you all are taking turns beautifully. I'll just pass it back and everybody parting thoughts, inspiration, and um, how and whether you'd like anybody to contact you. Well, okay. Um, I actually recruit people to 350 Wisconsin. I love it. And with respect to ready and enthusiastic, I would just like to say that if you care about this and you would like to hang out with other people who care about this and want to put your shoulder to the wheel, the folks that you will meet in 350 Wisconsin will be wonderful people to meet. To, to meet. Uh, I met Christina, uh, not a, well, so partly through 350 Wisconsin, and I'm, I'm just absolutely delighted. And Maria also. Uh, hi, Stephen. I hadn't read you yet, but that's great. Um, so... Uh, it's it's a great way to expand your um, your network and to feel like you're making a, a difference. And you can uh, contact me um, at susan.millar at 350wisconsin.org. Um, and you can also go to our website, which is 350wisconsin.org. Um, I also want to say that um, there's two resources that, that I'd like to mention to people. One is a YouTube video called The Story of Stuff. It's very, very cool. Uh, you learn a lot and you feel pretty motivated to think about the carbon that goes into a whole bunch of the stuff that is thrown at us. Um, it's a really interesting way to make sense of, of the stuff that ends up in landfills. Um, and another is, is this book, it's been around for quite a while. It's called Cradle to Cradle, 
remaking the way we make things. Um, the, it's got two authors that are kind of complicated. I'll just repeat the title, Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things. It's about the circular economy in the manufacturing uh, sector. Um, and a, a, a second actually would be um, a new book out by Dan Egan, who wrote the wonderful book. He's from Milwaukee Sentinel Journal. He wrote that wonderful book about the Great Lakes, but he's got a new book out called, um, oh, what's it? It's, oh, darn, I should have remembered the name. It's it's about um, phosphorus. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up and, and get back to you in a minute. But um, what's, what's amazing about it is that it helps us understand the huge impact that agriculture and and waste the waste of phosphorus in agriculture is is potentially of great harm to us, and it's another one one of these really important um, ways of, um, of of addressing climate climate challenges to our climate. So I think I'll I'll just stop there and um, pass to whomever next. Okay. Well, thank you, Susan. Um, well, I'm gonna go uh, again. You know. Um, you, you are, I would be delighted to have people join Wisconsin Ecolatinos. Uh, you can visit our website, www.wisconsinecolatinos.org. We are going to have a, a planting tree event this fall and next spring. Um, you know, I, I, that's what I recommend. Uh, you know, if you can plant a tree, you can do marvelous things. Um, if you're interested, uh, visit our website, join our mailing list, and and you will get information on on uh, when and how we're gonna we're gonna do these uh, planting tree events. Can I just jump in with that Dan Egan title? It's called "The Devil's Element: Phosphorus and a World Out of Balance." It's a brilliant book. Stephen, will you take it next? Uh, yeah, um, I used to, uh, I, I got my grad degree at Notre Dame and I met a lot and I, and I let, <laughs> and I read a lot of C.S. Lewis. Uh, he's the guy who wrote all the Chronicles of Narnia series. Those are just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, and he has, uh, he had this quote that I was going to share with you that I just think is beautiful. It, it, it applies to the spiritual life, but maybe also to this issue as well. I just apply it to everything. Come on now, folks. He says this, um, well, uh, he says, we have become like a child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because uh, he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Um, I, I just think that's so beautiful. Uh, I, I, I think that speaking about uh, settling and how we shouldn't settle, uh, we shouldn't settle for a, medi uh, a house that performs poorly or that's just okay, or we shouldn't settle for, uh, you know, too much phosphorus on the land, or we shouldn't settle, settle for environmental racism, or we, we, we shouldn't settle for, you know, put in your cause here. Um, I think a lot of education is needed among Madisonians. I think sharing and, and collaboration is needed. We need to put down the phones and get out and talk to our neighbors a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, all the people on this panel seem like fantastic resources that I like, I want to go have coffee with each of you and just uh, chat and or, you know, a nightcap or something, you know, it, it, like this is just just fantastic con conversation here. Um, I just try to work with homeowners and just kind of give them no BS and said, this is what's it. This is what you got to do now. Go do it. Uh, if, if you want to get a hold of me, 312-373-0555. Uh, uh, anytime before midnight, you can call that number 312-373-0555. And, and I'm Steven at madisonhomeperformance.com. But um, we're all just trying to help people, it sounds like. And this is all just totally fantastic. And I'm happy to be a part of it. So thank you. Yeah, and I will round it out. Take that first step. Make that call. Get engaged. Um, I put right here, osce at wisconsin.gov. Um, so if you want to email our team, we can help get you started. Um, we're just, we are happy to be uh, a resource for you. And we have, there's so many people working in this space. We're in such an 
opportune time right now that there's a huge network of people that are at the ready to help, but we also have funding. Um, there's funding uh, to be able to take advantage of. And so we wanna get as much of that to, to Wisconsin as possible. Fantastic. Thank you everyone uh, so much for making uh, the time to be here today uh, for all your wonderful insights. And thank you to everyone uh, who is watching uh, to see more Cap Times Idea Fest sessions. Mm -hmm. um, there's even one about trash and uh, what ends up in landfills. Um, I'm looking forward to watching that one. Uh, you can visit captimesideafest.com or you can find us on YouTube. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.